Have you ever been suspected of a serious crime? A crime that you didn't commit? If not, then that's good, because I had to face it. I tried not to look for problems at all, and I was extremely calm and inconspicuous. But by some coincidence, all the problems collapsed on me at one point and I had to clean up this she tot. I'm Parker, and my wife Bonnie and I have been together for five eventful years. We crossed paths a week before Christmas during my senior year of high school. At that time, my sole ambition was to bed as many girls as I could. Bonnie proved to be the challenge I couldn't conquer. Reflecting on it now, element not accepting defeat. I wish that's precisely what I had done. Instead, I persisted in my attempts to win her over throughout the remainder of my senior year. Graduation marked the start my downfall. Despite my desire to get my instrument out as early as possible, everything turned out quite the opposite. Consequently, after a night out together, we discovered that she was pregnant two months later, which made us think about the available honeymoon options suitable for expectant mothers. My hopes of going to college have been postponed indefinitely. I've always been captivated by computer programming and delved into several college-level courses during my later years in high school. I possess a solid command of SQL and can effortlessly construct queries, views, functions, and stored procedures. Crafting triggers for intricate data scenarios is also within my skill set. Utilizing available tools and resources on the Internet, I've honed my proficiency significantly. The beauty of it is that I can work from virtually anywhere with Wi-Fi, which in my case means I don't have to step out of my house. However, my current situation is somewhat complicated. Due to an altercation at a nightclub where I resorted to physical violence, I find myself under house arrest for the next 10 months. Despite not being a physically imposing individual, this incident marked the first altercation I've had since grade school, and it was more of an ambush than a fair fight. Luckily, I managed to avoid felony charges. After Bonnie gave birth to our son, Adam, we experienced a tranquil six months. I held a decently paying programming job, working in an office alongside about a dozen other programmers. Bonnie and I engaged in adult activities despite being only 20 and rather inexperienced in many aspects of life. Bonnie insists she took her birth control pills, yet here we are, in the doctor's office, staring at a sonogram revealing three sets of tiny hands and feet. Things proceeded smoothly. Bevan arrived first, followed shortly by Connie, and finally, Danny completed our family. I'm seriously contemplating undergoing sterilization before we expand our family further. Dealing with a stubborn toddler in his terrible twos, who feels neglected compared to his whining sisters, can be exhausting. So one Saturday night, we had Bonnie's parents babysit. Bonnie and I enjoyed dinner at a franchise restaurant before discovering a nightclub with a live band. It was our first time at a bar since turning 21. The place was crowded, making conversation and dancing challenging. We opted for a different nightclub, lacking a live band but equipped with a jukebox and dance floor, where around 40 people were having a good time. After a few dances and some drinks, we found ourselves seated near three other couples, all strangers. The men chatted about sports, while the women discussed who knows what. Some other men approached our table and invited the ladies to dance. Two agreed, while two declined. I observed Bonnie joining a man on the dance floor. After a couple of lively dances, she returned. Later, a different man asked her to dance. She glanced at me and I nodded my approval. They danced together for a few fast and slow songs and it appeared there was no inappropriate behavior on the dance floor. I excused myself to visit the restroom and up on my return, Bonnie was nowhere to be found. Despite my efforts to search, she remained elusive. Stepping outside, I observed a man with his right hand positioned between Bonnie's legs outside her jeans, vigorously touching her. She seemed to be reciprocating, with her hands around his neck, while his left hand ventured under her blouse, and their faces were in close proximity. Without hesitation, I intervened by delivering a forceful kick to the side of his leg, just below the knee, causing him to cry out in pain. I then forcefully pressed his blonde locks against the concrete block building, causing him to collapse. Subsequent kicks thwarted any further misconduct on his part. It seemed my final kick had a significant impact, possibly affecting his reproductive organs. 
Security intervened shortly after. Turning to Bonnie, I demanded, What were you doing? Her response was incoherent, leaving me baffled. How she managed to return home remains a mystery to me. Throughout the night, I pondered whether intoxication led to such inappropriate behavior. Our group found ourselves confined to a holding cell, six of us in total. After my parents posted bail for me and brought me home, Bonnie repeatedly apologized. However, I eventually confronted her, stating, Apologies don't clarify the motives behind your actions. When you're ready to explain that, I'll be all ears. But until then, please refrain from speaking. Despite my request, no explanation was ever provided. Sexual intimacy declined as the tension in the household persisted. Bonnie made efforts to avoid conflicts. Despite our financial constraints limiting us to a novice lawyer, I doubted that splurging on a top-tier attorney would have yielded better results. I received a sentence of 11 months under house arrest, confining me to my home except for medical emergencies or transportation by ambulance or police car. My constant presence became overwhelming for Bonnie. She began socializing with neighbors over coffee to cope. However, I found solace in spending time with my family. Fortunately, my boss accommodated my situation, allowing me to participate in online meetings to stay updated on project requirements and progress. The next blow to our marriage came less than a month into my confinement. Parker, I'll be direct. I can't bear sitting idle every night while you're stuck here. Since that incident where I was groped, I've been reconsidering my choices. I met someone at the supermarket, and I'm going out on a date with him Friday night. I had intended to remain composed and speak sensibly, but my reaction was quite different. Bonnie, gripped by fear, sought refuge in our bedroom and secured the door. I explicitly conveyed that our marriage would be terminated if she persisted. Upon her retreat to the bedroom, I promptly contacted both sets of parents, who promptly agreed to come over. Bonnie's parents, Roger and Edith, and mine share striking similarities. My mother, Julie, and Edith both embody a nurturing Aunt Bea persona. While Julie occasionally opts for trousers, Edith exclusively dons floor-length dresses, which conceal any potential extra appendages. My father, Mark, and Roger bear resemblance, too, sporting fashionable beards and receding hairlines. I recounted my understanding of Bonnie's grievances to the assembled group. Despite Edith's efforts to coax her out, the situation escalated beyond control. Amidst heated exchanges, Bonnie abruptly called an end to the evening. With a chilling ultimatum, Bonnie warned, If you ever want to see your grandchildren again, you will stay out of my personal life. The expressions of sympathy from our parents were evident as they bid their farewells with comforting hugs. Bonnie retreated once more to the bedroom, locking the door behind her, leaving me to spend another night on the couch. Bonnie was hardly home for the remainder of the week, and I was clueless about her whereabouts. I found myself responsible for four affectionate yet needy mouths to feed and attend to. Mark arranged for a visit from a divorce lawyer, leaving me feeling trapped with limited options. Unless Bonnie was proven unfit as a mother, I faced nearly 18 years of child support along with expenses for spousal support, housing, and other obligations. On Friday evening, just past six, the disrespectful remark from Bonnie came, I'm not sure if I'll return tonight. I pleaded with Bonnie one final time not to leave. Despite my pleas, she drove away, signaling the end of our marriage. Around 1 a.m., my phone rang, but I didn't recognize the number, so I let it go to voicemail. Upon hearing the message tone, I decided to listen. Mr. Douglas, this is Abby from University Hospital. Your wife, Bonnie, has been admitted. While she's not in danger, she'll need surgery tomorrow. I wanted to inform you. My number is... Part of me felt a sense of justice. However, I couldn't leave the house. Did he harm her? Was she in a car accident? Was he behind the wheel? Sleep eluded me as I pondered these questions. The hungry cries of the three little hens only added to my exhaustion and I was drained by the time the roosters announced dawn. At 8 a.m., the doorbell interrupted my thoughts. Approaching the front door, I noticed a sleek sedan parked behind my car. The man standing at the door displayed his badge and asked, Is Parker Douglas here? That would be me. How can I assist you, detective? John, isn't it? Yes, 
Call me John. Are you aware that your wife is in the hospital? I am. Is that all you have for me? No. Where were you around midnight last night? If you bothered to check, you'd already have the answer, I replied, gesturing toward my ankle monitor. Oh, my apologies. I should have done some research. Do you know anyone who might wish harm upon your wife? No one immediately comes to mind. The hospital left a message about her being there. That's all I know. What happened? I must say, Parker, your demeanor is rather perplexing. Care to elaborate? She decided to end our marriage last night and went on a date. I somewhat hope her companion assaulted her severely. His expression turned grave. Nothing of that sort, at least not as far as I know. As she was leaving a motel room, she was physically attacked. There's no indication of sexual assault from her. Her face is badly bruised, but the most severe damage is to her left hand. Each finger was broken with a hammer. They left a message on her face with a black marker. Choices have consequences. Despite the grim news, I found myself smiling. I had no involvement whatsoever in this. I can't help you, John. If you'll excuse me, I hear children who need feeding again. I considered reaching out to Bonnie's parents to inform them of what I knew. But ultimately, I decided Bonnie should handle that conversation herself. The day was filled with the usual chaos of caring for the children, feeding, bathing, changing diapers, and repeat. I barely had time to spare for ten minutes of television, and my programming projects were piling up, indicating another late night of coding ahead. Just past 4 p.m., my phone rang, displaying Bonnie's name on the caller ID. I chose to let it go to voicemail. Parker, I don't know if you're aware, but I was assaulted last night. They performed surgery on my left hand today. All my fingers and thumb are broken and my entire hand is in a cast. Could you arrange for someone to drop off a change of clothes for when I come home tomorrow? How are my babies? Please give me a call. It's as if I'm her damn caretaker. Screw you, bitch. Put on your provocative outfit and go home. During dinner, my favorite detective showed up at my doorstep. Mr. Douglas, I have a search warrant for your residence. John, no need to be so formal. Please come in. Would you like something to drink? No, thank you. I remained silent as they seized my computers and engaged in thorough searching. John's assistants exchanged looks indicating they found nothing. John, what's happening? There's been a related assault. It appears to be a case of sexual retaliation. We've connected this individual to your wife. His genitals were mutilated, with the same message written on his face in black marker. I winced. Mutilated? That must be painful. Similar to Bonnie's assault, I had no involvement in this whatsoever. Well, it seems like karma's caught up with him. Best of luck with your investigation. Oh, and since you're confiscating my phone, could you please call my dad for me? John dialed Mark's number. I asked him if he could lend me a laptop and get me a cheap disposable phone. My parents arrived with dinner, and I briefed them on what I knew. My mom voiced what I was already thinking. She deserves it. Bonnie continued to send additional messages, portraying herself as the victim of a random incident, rather than expressing any remorse for her decision to end the marriage. I chose not to engage with her voicemails or texts. On Sunday, around noon, she was dropped off at our house by a car. The children were thrilled to see her. I made an effort to stay in other parts of the house for the rest of the day. Despite her struggles with the children, I ignored her requests for assistance. If you're unable to handle something, then retreat to the bedroom and I'll take care of it. Parker, please don't act this way. We're still married. I'll be in this cast for at least ten weeks. I need your cooperation. I disregarded her and entered my office space. With headphones on and music blocking out my surroundings, I managed to accomplish some work. I caught the scent of dinner cooking and sensed a tap on my shoulder. Bonnie passed me a note. The kids need baths. I can't risk getting my cast wet. I'll be in the bedroom. When John returned my computers and phone, he informed me that my browser history and cell phone activity were of no use to them. It was satisfying to be able to say, I told you so. Bonnie inquired John about the recovery of her rings. 
She had been wearing my wedding band along with her maternal grandmother's wedding band. Apparently, the attackers removed them before injuring her fingers. John replied that no rings had been found or turned in. We existed in a stalemate. Bonnie would attempt to exert influence and I would stand firm until the bedroom door closed. She made daily attempts to sway my determination, but I remained resolute. On a Thursday, Bonnie emerged from the bedroom in seductive attire while I was on the phone with Edith. She informed me, I have plans for another date, unsure if I'll return tonight. I gazed at her in shock. It became clear I needed a divorce promptly. I refused to endure being cuckolded. Though I would miss my children, I felt I had reached my breaking point. Edith agreed to take the kids to their doctor's appointment on Friday and expressed her dismay regarding Bonnie's actions. While she offered moral support, I was too overwhelmed to think rationally. Fortunately, the comforting presence of my children offered a glimmer of hope for the future. I was in a deep sleep when my phone suddenly rang. Seeing an unfamiliar number, I allowed it to go to voicemail. Later, upon hearing the notification tone, I listened to the message. Mr. Douglas, this is Mary from University Hospital. Your wife, Bonnie, has been admitted. I'm reaching out as a courtesy. You can reach me at... What in the world? Was this a repeat of our first encounter? I doubted she was with the same person. Injuries like those don't heal so quickly. Perhaps this person had assaulted her. It was disturbing to realize that part of me wished for her demise due to her injuries. Twisted, I know, but my life is in Uttakaus right now. After taking a sip of whiskey and drifting into sleep, my concern for Bonnie vanished. With a mug of coffee in hand, I welcomed John as he approached the front door. John, good to see you again. What's the latest? Here's your copy of the search warrant. Same pattern. Assaulted, leaving the motel, broken fingers, and another message on her face. Another victim with mutilated privates. You're elusive, but we're determined to apprehend you. Give it your best shot, John, but I'm just as clueless as you are. Same message? On the man, yes, on Bonnie, a second message. You're a slow learner. Feet are next. You mentioned broken fingers. Right hand this time? That's correct. She'll be incapacitated for quite some time. Unfortunate for her. Don't expect me to come to her aid. Before they confiscated my phones, I phoned my dad to request borrowing his laptop once more. Additionally, I mentioned needing another disposable phone. Fortunately, all my work is stored in the cloud. I had the foresight to create backups of everything, transfer them onto thumb drives, and entrust them to my dad for safekeeping. On Friday around 4 p.m., I received a call from Bonnie. Well, not exactly Bonnie herself, but someone calling on her behalf. She sounded distressed, fretting about how she would manage this and that. She kept on complaining, oblivious to the fact that I couldn't care less. Perhaps her parents will provide her with shelter. During dinner, Julie stopped by and assisted with looking after the children. When my phone rang, she noticed it was Bonnie answered and activated the speakerphone. Parker, you need to assist me. Bonnie, this is Julie. Don't expect Parker or any of his acquaintances to aid someone like you. Julie, I've told you to refrain from meddling in my personal affairs. Put Parker on the line. She offered me the phone, but I declined, so she ended the call. On Sunday, Bonnie attempted to contact me again. I let it go to voicemail. Parker, if I return home, will you support me? Please call. I didn't call back. I have no knowledge of her whereabouts. John returned my electronics a few days earlier than before, with the same warning that they still suspect my involvement. Monday morning, I was surprised by an unexpected visitor. Edith, what brings you here? I'm here to assist you with the children. What about Bonnie? What about her? Isn't she staying with you? No. She asked us to mind our own business, so we've stopped answering her calls. We haven't seen her since the night she instructed us to stay out of her life. I believe she's staying with one of her friends, possibly someone from her wedding party. They've called on Bonnie's behalf several times, but we've informed them that we no longer consider her our daughter. In that case, please come in. Would you like some coffee? Black, please. Where are my babies? Edith stayed out of my way and spent the entire day looking after the children. When they were asleep, she took care of the laundry and did some general cleaning. 
Initially, I thought it was just for one day, but she has returned every day since. Some days, Roger joins her. I managed to catch up on my work projects and even had time for a guilt-free nap. I haven't received any communication from Bonnie, and Edith confirms she hasn't either. My attorney suggested it was an opportune moment to initiate divorce proceedings, considering that Bonnie has effectively abandoned the children. With Edith staying for dinner, I can structure my day as if I were still married. The previously chaotic days have now settled into a tranquil rhythm. However, this newfound calmness allows ample time for me to contemplate my situation with Bonnie and nurture my resentment. My mother visits several times a week, too. The grandparents have a much better relationship than Bonnie and I ever did. When the kids have a medical appointment, one of the grandparents usually takes them. Once the paperwork was prepared, Bonnie was served. Her voicemails were filled with explicit language and threats. I chose not to delete them, thinking they might offer the court a clearer understanding of Bonnie's behavior. Given my limited mobility, the lawyers' meetings took place in my front yard. I hoped this would bring an added layer of shame for Bonnie. They were determined to argue for Bonnie's custody rights and to secure child support from me. We made similar claims against Bonnie, asserting that she needed to find employment to contribute to child support. Given her skill set, it seemed unlikely she could manage this without resorting to earnings from escort services. The initial court hearing didn't go well for Bonnie. My lawyer portrayed me as the sole provider for the children over the past eight weeks. They countered this by stating that due to her injuries, Bonnie couldn't use her hands. When questioned why I wasn't assisting her, my attorney presented depositions from Bonnie's two lovers with injured genitalia, I affirmed that I didn't approve of Bonnie engaging in extramarital affairs. Bonnie and her legal team huddled for several minutes. Their final move was presenting a piece of paper containing a cautionary message to Bonnie. My lawyer contended that the note could have been fabricated solely for dramatic effect. Bonnie's lawyers lacked evidence regarding the origin of the note. I was not involved in its creation. Now, we await further proceedings. The court requested additional documentation from Bonnie regarding her abandonment of the children. According to my attorney, this development bodes well for our case. After the left-hand cast was removed, Bonnie entered the house. She found all her belongings crammed into the laundry room, which infuriated her. My lawyer advised me to let her back in, as not doing so would create a negative impression. Despite my hope that the children would reject Bonnie, they didn't. While holding Connie, she attempted a different approach. Parker, what do I need to do to move past this? I still love you and I believe you love me too. I'm sorry for hurting you. I was immature, but I've grown a lot in the past three months. Bonnie, you're mistaken. I no longer love you. The sooner I can remove you from my life, the better. I'm not leaving. You'll still have to deal with me when you visit your children. I grew increasingly frustrated prompting me to head to my office. Our upcoming court date loomed nearer. Bonnie was asleep on the couch and we continued to avoid each other almost constantly. Similar to before when she had only one functional hand, I took care of matters once Bonnie was confined to a room. When our case was called, Bonnie appeared pleased to see her parents present, although she hadn't seen them since the argument preceding her first court appearance. She waved at them, but they ignored her. Her demeanor shifted when my attorney summoned Edith to the stand. Edith, may I address you as such? Yes. Bonnie is your daughter? Was. We disown her now. Why is that? She's promiscuous and entirely unfit to raise my grandchildren. Parker is more than capable of caring for them. While Bonnie was incapacitated, engaging in promiscuous behavior, Parker was at home looking after the children. She's abandoned them. I won't allow my precious angels to grow up thinking that promiscuity is an acceptable lifestyle choice. Isn't it true that Parker is currently under house arrest? Yes, but that's because he assaulted someone he believed was harming Bonnie. Turns out she was engaging in promiscuous behavior that night, too. No further questions, Your Honor. Bonnie's attorney wisely chose not to cross-examine. Celebratory high-fives ensued when I was granted custody and Bonnie was mandated to provide child support. Alimony wasn't necessary as I was covering all housing expenses. When my lawyer presented the recorded threatening voicemails, 
The judge ruled that the initial three months of visitation must be supervised. I had anticipated feeling elated as a liberated man, but instead it was a mix of melancholy and a touch of relief. Not much changed back at the house. Edith visited every day, and she and Julie took charge of my romantic life. I made it clear that finding a romantic partner wasn't a priority. That was until one Saturday morning when Carmen showed up at my doorstep. Edith had invited her over to help with the kids. Carmen had a son just a week older than Adam. Her husband had died in a car accident when she was five months pregnant. She was two years older than me and worked in customer support for an insurance agency. It was clear to everyone that this was a setup, but I didn't object. While the kids slept, Carmen and I sat at the kitchen table and talked. I shared the story of my house arrest, and she told me about her late husband. Just as I was about to tell her about Bonnie, there was a knock on the front door. Bonnie, good to see you. The kids are asleep now. I assume the lady with you is overseeing today. Yes, this is Margot Hansen. I greeted Margot with a handshake before checking her credentials. Edith waved goodbye as she exited through the back door. I welcomed Margot and Bonnie inside. Bonnie, this is Carmen, a dear friend of mine. Her son, Chad, is asleep with Adam. Bonnie's gaze towards Carmen could have caused damage if it were possible. Carmen, however, maintained a wide smile and greeted Bonnie softly. Nice to meet you, Bonnie. Bonnie roused the children while I escorted Carmen to the door. Would you like me to bring dinner tonight? After all, we're close friends. Without hesitation, I leaned in for a kiss, which was reciprocated. I'd love that. See you tonight. Bonnie observed closely as I interacted with Carmen. Everyone watched as Carmen waved from her car while driving off. Four hours later, as Bonnie and Margot departed at the end of their scheduled visit, I found myself excited at the thought of having dinner with a woman for the first time in six months. After feeding the kids and putting them down for a nap, I took a quick shower, shaved, and applied a touch of aftershave. I selected a nice shirt and clean pair of jeans. While I was changing Bevan's diaper, the doorbell rang. Carmen had changed clothes too. She assisted me with the hens while the boys were playing. The casserole she brought was enough to last me for several days. We conversed until nearly midnight, which I truly appreciated. Carmen wasn't merely a passive listener. She encouraged me to delve into the thoughts and emotions surrounding Bonnie's mistreatment of me. Convincing her of my innocence regarding the assaults required all my powers of persuasion. I'm unsure if she truly believes me, but it's the truth. Close to midnight, she hugged a drowsy Chad and departed. I requested to meet her again, and she agreed. Our goodnight kiss held much more passion than the earlier peck. I had previously thought I didn't require female companionship, but I spent the entire night tossing and turning, reconsidering. Edith arrived early on Sunday, eager to hear about how things had gone with Bonnie. However, she quickly shifted the conversation to discuss Carmen. I remained reserved about my feelings. At this point, I doubt any woman would be interested in a young father with four mouths to feed and care for. Though I might be mistaken about that. Carmen brings over a casserole every Saturday. With two more months of house arrest, my entertainment options are limited to television or music. When Carmen requested music, she pulled me up to dance. I struggled to prevent my arousal from showing. Unfortunately, she succeeded in provoking a reaction. Parker, I'm not prepared to dive into another relationship, but it's empowering to know I still captivate you. Can you handle taking things slow? Carmen, I believe so. My thoughts are jumbled. I'm unsure of what I want. Does that make sense? Completely. I can't fathom what you've been through, and I'm equally certain you can't understand my experiences. It will take time. Edith had entrusted me with looking after the kids during weekends. On Tuesday, she asked me to take a seat. Parker, I don't want to control your life. Well, maybe a bit. I had a chat with Carmen's mom last night. They reside on the East Coast. She mentioned that Carmen's car had broken down and she couldn't afford repairs. With rent and childcare expenses, she barely had a few hundred bucks left each month. Do you think we could take care of Chad and save her the childcare costs? Adam and Chad seem to get along well. Mom, I believe it would be a thoughtful gesture from us, 
but I'd still need your assistance. How much does she need for the car repairs? I feel like I owe her for the casseroles she's been bringing over. Thank you, Parker. I'll find out about the car. The next morning, Carmen showed up at my doorstep. A lady sat in the driver's seat, waving at me. Carmen had a sparkle in her eyes. Thank you, Parker. This means a lot. Not a problem, Carmen. See you later today. Fixing Carmen's car cost about $300. I considered it a worthwhile investment. Seeing Carmen every day was an added bonus. Our greetings and farewells now resembled those exchanged by lovers. The hugs carried much more passion. My period of house arrest had concluded. I seized the chance to go for a 10-mile jog around the neighborhood. I casually mentioned an idea to Carmen. Could you possibly arrange to have Friday off? I'm thinking of planning a full-day date for us. Edith can look after the kids. I'd suggest this weekend, but both Edith and Julie have prior commitments. That sounds wonderful. I'll give you a call later today from the office. A few hours later, our date was set. My heart was racing with excitement. Friday couldn't have gone any smoother. On the day, I picked up Carmen and Chad early. After dropping Chad off at my place where Edith was looking after him, we headed to the marina. The three-hour guided tour provided us with some much-needed intimate moments. With the amusement park now open, we spent the following five hours hopping from one queue to another. Eventually, it was time to head back. Parker, I'm tired of waiting for you to take the initiative. Can I stay over tonight? Hmm, let me think. How about staying for the weekend? The kiss confirmed that it was a yes. Once the kids were asleep, I pondered my next move. I didn't want to appear too eager, yet I also didn't want to seem disinterested. I made us drinks and then suggested, shall we watch some TV in the bedroom? I sensed that Carmen was wrestling with the same thoughts. We barely lasted a minute on the bed before getting swept up in a passionate kiss. Our actions felt instinctual. I squeezed her breasts through her clothes, and she scratched at my zipper. Once we both acknowledged our desires, our clothes vanished swiftly. The glow of the television provided enough light to reveal our toned bodies. Given my inconsistent diet, Carmen noticed my thin chest. I wasn't exactly portraying a macho image at that moment. We explored each other mutually with our tongues, and I was on the verge of climax. Carmen brought me to completion with her hand and then I used my fingers to bring her to orgasm. We both acknowledged the need to refine our oral skills. I'm still on birth control. Are you confident you're free of any diseases? I got tested when everything started and all results were negative. So yes, I believe so. I've never been tested, so you'll have to trust that I'm clean too. Ready to take it all the way? Yes, I was more than ready, multiple times over and again after tending to the chickens. Saturday turned out to be the best day I'd had in a year. We made love while the kids were asleep. With a shortage of car seats, we opted for delivery from an Italian restaurant. Our nightcap took a slightly different turn as we each endeavored to improve our oral skills. Although I didn't climax in her mouth, Carmen's efforts were successful. It was clear that my oral skills needed the most work. Despite Carmen's intense arousal, I only managed to elicit a few tremors. While we were giving lunch to the children, Carmen's phone rang. It was her mother calling. She answered the call in the living room away from the bustling kitchen. When she returned, her complexion was pale. I need to go to my mom. My father had a heart attack and is on life support. Can you gather Chad's things? I'll be arranging travel. What can you say in such a situation? I expressed my condolences. I assured her of my support. I shed a tear with her. I believe I was crying as much for her pain as I was for the loss of her presence. She was at the airport in less than 90 minutes. I suppose I was uncertain about where I stood. Our relationship was casual, friends with benefits. But was there more to it than that? A couple of nights and a day of intimacy doesn't necessarily imply anything deeper. Yet I couldn't deny my feelings for Carmen went beyond mere friendship. Did she feel the same way? Or was I just hoping she did? We needed to have a conversation. Carmen called late in the day. Her flight was on schedule, and she comforted her mother while her father fought for his life. It wasn't the right time to discuss our relationship. 
Her father survived, albeit in a diminished state. Brain damage from lack of oxygen left him unable to care for himself. Communication with Carmen became sparse. I left messages. She left messages. It seemed I had my answer. Edith and Julie noticed my sadness and resumed their matchmaking efforts. Free from previous constraints, the few dates I went on were more conventional. I quickly learned to mention my four young children up front. As I had anticipated, opportunities for dating were scarce. Closure with Carmen came in the form of a two-page letter. Her father passed away, and she decided to stay on the East Coast. She cherished our time together and wished me well in finding someone new. It stung. I won't deny that. I traded in my sedan for an SUV to accommodate four car seats and another adult. The grocery store cashiers looked out for me, ensuring I didn't purchase anything unsuitable for my quartet. I remain hopeful that I'll find love again. Believing otherwise is too disheartening. A year after Carmen departed, Edith found me alone. Parker, I got word from Carmen's mom. Edith seemed unsure of my reaction. How are they? Seems someone misses you, hoping she hadn't burned bridges. I've always liked Carmen's mom. What's her name again? Chuckling, Edith replied. Parker, you know who I mean. If you're asking if I'd welcome her back, without hesitation. Three days later, my heart skipped a beat when I found Carmen waiting for me at home after work. Chad and Adam were fine sharing a room, and so were Carmen and I. With the assistance of all the grandparents, we are successfully raising five wonderful children. We attempt to manage on Carmen and my incomes alone, but the grandparents tend to spoil the kids with purchases that exceed our budget. Bonnie remarried about a year after the divorce was finalized. Although she still visits, she is significantly behind on her child support payments. To the kids, she's more like a sporadic visitor than a mother figure. They see Nana Edith as their primary maternal figure. Carmen and I opted for a simple courthouse wedding. Neither of us has any desire for more children. Five is plenty. No charges were ever brought against anyone for the assaults on Bonnie or her partners. Bonnie and her parents remain estranged. However, I continue to regard Edith and Roger as the loving grandparents they are. During Christmas, three and a half years after Bonnie's departure, I found myself alone in the kitchen with Edith. Curious, I inquired about the two rings she wore. She spun the one on her ring finger, then the other on her pinky. These, she said with a wink, this one is my wedding band, and this one belonged to my mother. I was taken aback by her revelation. With a secretive gesture, she placed her index finger to her lips and whispered, Shoosh! That's the end of the story. Write your opinion in the comments about this story. It will be interesting for us to read it. Also, do not forget to like and subscribe to our channel so as not to miss new, equally interesting and exciting stories. Good luck!